Uh, so welcome everyone to Research with Relevance um, Friday Features. We've got a great show here today. We'll be um, featuring uh, Jessica Stevenson, who you can see here in front of us. Uh, but before we um, watch the video of Jessica, I just want to share with you a couple of exciting things that we had going on this week. So we, um, we had some great programming coming out of Ethics Week and our office um, hosted, I thought, a lively discussion around the movie Picture a Scientist. And if you haven't had a chance to see that movie, I strongly encourage it. It's, it's a very powerful movie um, about women in science. And um, it was the, we, the way we think about it, it was hosted by our office and the Office of Diversity. We think about it as a beginning conversation and, and we look forward to coming up with more programming uh, to discuss these issues. I also wanted to share with you that the Smithsonian Institute is hosting a free webinar series all next week around um, black inventors and innovators. And um, it's free to us. If you go to our homepage, you can get all of the information on how to um, sign up for that webinar. And I'm looking forward to that programming also. So um, with that, uh, if I didn't introduce myself, I am Phaedra Corso, Vice President for Research. I'm your host for today. Uh, just a few uh, housekeeping tips. We would ask that you keep your microphone muted unless you're asking a question in the end. Um, if you uh, want to ask a question, you are welcome to um, put a question into the chats feature if you have that capability. And if not, then just raise your hand and we will call on you when it gets to that point in time. Um, so let's go ahead and begin. We're, I think this is going to be a pretty lively discussion. Uh, we're very excited to have Jessica Stevenson here with us from the College of the Arts. Um, we've gotten in the research office, we've gotten to know Jessica very well this uh, last year because she served on our research advisory committee. And so we appreciate her service on that committee. Jessica is an associate professor of art history in the School of Art and Design. She is originally from South Africa and she has pursued a two pronged career. She's been a full time faculty member at KSU since 2013 and she's worked as a curator in several museums, including the Johannesburg Art Gallery in South Africa. Jessica focuses her research on African art, which she'll be talking to us today uh, from the 19th to the 21st centuries and we'll be hearing about that uh, more in a minute. And she earned her PhD in art history from Emory University. So um, I, I'm looking forward to seeing the video. And again, our thanks to Tom Boyle for creating the video and also to my staff, Heather and Joelle for coordinating this whole event. And I'm gonna be quiet and let you play the video. My name is Jessica Stevenson, and I am an Associate Professor of Art History in the College of the Arts. As a first generation white South African, I came of age during the last decades of the apartheid era, a time of extreme segregation and draconian martial law. Looking back, I realized these formative years shaped my research focus which is the role art can play as witness to history. I've been privileged to have traveled widely within Africa, the Americas, and Europe. Travel can lead to personal growth through immersion in places different to home, a perspective I strive to instill in students I take on study abroad programs and a topic I have published on. My research is focused on African art from the 19th through 21st centuries, periods of dramatic change for that continent, between 1997 and 2001, I conducted field work to document art created by four rural Khoisan communities in Botswana and South Africa. The Khoisan are First Nation peoples. Historically, they practiced an egalitarian hunter-gatherer way of life, followed a shamanic form of religion, and speak some of the oldest known languages. This research stretched me as a person asked me to navigate five languages, none of which were my own, become more than guest within host communities and to practice research with real relevance, research grounded in local cultural values and with tangible benefits for marginalized people. I have also worked as an art museum curator, organizing numerous exhibitions on African ceramics, textiles, sculpture, and metalwork. 
as well as modern and contemporary African art idioms. I am committed to mentoring undergraduate and graduate student research projects, and I often include students as co-curators and research in my projects. My current research takes me into archives and museum collections throughout the United States and Europe. I locate, record, study, and then publish and curate exhibitions on photographs and carved ivory sculptures produced during the 19th century along the Luongo coast, a region of the Congo that stretches from present-day Gabon to Angola. I'm developing an encyclopedic archive, a process that involves several phases. Documenting photographs is a straightforward process, but I need to take hundreds of digital images to capture the complex form, composition, and details of each carved ivory sculpture. These images are then catalogued, work that is currently being done by my wonderful first-year scholar who is serving as my research assistant, Lexi Lyons. The second phase of research entails analysis of subject types and variations to track trends and changes over the course of 70-some years as African artists developed, shared, and modified an evolving repertoire of images. The third phase of work involves synthesizing digital images to make 3D scans. Printed copies can be handled as the artists intended the artworks to be. We can roll the object side to side to better read the minute images within the complex multi-directional narratives. These carved ivory sculptures are significant historical documents. The artists who created them bear witness to the tense cultural, economic, and social landscape of a region as it transitioned through the end of the transatlantic slave trade, became a global supplier of commodities such as ivory and rubber, and grappled with the onset of French and Belgian colonial rule. European photographers and African carvers developed a shared repertoire of images. My research finds that the photographs tend to validate the colonial project with images of white authority, economic abundance, and a compliant labor force. The African sculptures, which were created by artists who were members of the Vili ethnic group, bring to light overlooked voices and perspectives. The carvers edit photographs used as source material. Their works are emotive, expressing humor, shock, and pathos. They self-fashion, humanize, and change the colonial narrative. Hundreds of ivory sculptures are now housed in museums and private collections outside of Africa, yet very little is known about the carvers. My research is uncovering images of these artists and even some of their names. While this research material may document practices that are distant in time and space, it nevertheless raises many issues that are close to home, calling for conversations on social justice, empathy, ethics, human and animal rights, privilege, racism, globalization, the environment, and so much more. I've taught an honors discovery course titled The African Elephant and Its Ivory, Commodity, Ethics, and Art. Students researched the impact that the commodification of ivory has had on the species and solutions needed to ensure its survival. The ivory carvings I study are a product of the 19th century global frenzy for elephant ivory, destined for international markets where it served as raw material in a pre-plastics era. Millions of African elephants have been killed, and the sale of most elephant ivory is at present illegal. This project is also important because it brings to light an understudied African art form and excluded histories by assembling and making accessible a database of work scattered worldwide. Today, museums face mounting pressure to make their collections more accessible, to rethink who tells the stories, and to return African art to original communities. Repatriation of physical objects is a complex, expensive process. Building a digital archive addresses restitution, access, and community building needs in a practical and relatively low budget format. Great, thank you.
and welcome Jessica. We can't hear you. <laughs> OK, thank you so much, Fedra. I want to thank you for this opportunity and to your amazing team. It's been an absolute one a joy to work with them the last month or so. Great, thank you. Um, I have a million questions, and so I'm sure lots of people who have, who just watch the video do also. But I'm going to my first question for you is what does it mean to be a curator? You talk about that as one of your tracks uh, of your profession, and I think I know what it is, but I'd love for you to to uh, define it for us. Absolutely. So first of all, before I dive into what a curator is, I, I just want to give a, a, a huge shout out to uh, the College of the Arts that as of Wednesday now officially has our first uh, graduate program, an MA in Art and Design, and there will be a concentration in museum studies. So uh, I'm very much looking forward to working with my colleagues, my wonderful colleagues in the School of Art and Design, as well as beyond the School of Art and Design, uh, to train uh, students, some of whom who might want to become curators, but who, who would also want to pursue other careers um, within the museum field. So what is a curator? Well, I think that uh, the very sort of traditional definition of what a curator would be, and this would apply to both the art museum, but really to natural history museums, to history museums, would be a keeper of collections. So the traditional role of the curator would be someone who builds collections, so they actively collect, and that would be through donor cultivation, for, through purchasing objects, or working with donors uh, to gift objects, collections to museums. Uh, they're also responsible for the care of the collection in the sense that they're responsible for conducting research on the collection. And then also um, for sharing the, the, the collection in the form of exhibitions. Curators also typically curate exhibitions, though, uh, that might be temporary, they might be short term loans, they might be special exhibitions that you host at your uh, institution where you work, but they could equally travel. Um, so being a curator is a it's it requires someone who is really able to juggle a lot of different uh, roles is as is, is a good team member because museums are by nature very uh, interesting organisms you get to work with educators you need to work with a collections manager with conservators with membership uh, so it's an incredibly dynamic field but i think uh, where we are currently now in the museum field is that the role of the collector, I mean of the curator, really needs to expand beyond that idea of caring for a collection to really being someone who cares for and builds community. So that you're someone who's not just working with objects, but you're working with people. Uh, and that I think is, is definitely an aspect of sort of curation that's on you know very much uh, in the forefront at the moment that I'm excited to explore with students. And so if I'm a student you know I, I can get a master's degree or, or an undergraduate degree that's going to move me in into that field but what else do they need because it sounds like you're talking a lot about something way bigger than just an education. Absolutely. So, you know, definitely having uh, a degree in the field in art history or studio art is important and preferably you, you need to have a, an MA or, or a PhD. Um, but I think even more critical or just as critical is having on the ground experience. And so when our students enter our programs, one of the first things they hear from me in their first year is you need to get involved with museums in any which way you can, and it doesn't matter which museum it is. So, um, you know, typically curators find themselves in a position when they do research, it's very rare that you're doing research on a museum collection that's uniquely your own. So for instance, when I was a curator at the Carlos Museum, I was curating a collection that was all 19th and 20th traditional canonical African art, but my research specialty is, is really modern and contemporary. So you have to you have to sort of be a generalist. So you have to dive in, take every opportunity you can. Um, so I encourage students become a docent which means that you uh, you get to give tours in the galleries and you have access to all aspects of the of the museum. 
do internships for credit or not, volunteer, build up as much experience as you possibly can because um, I think it's very rare for someone to get a job in a museum with just a degree. You really have to have uh, years of experience on the ground. Mm -hmm. Good, and thank you for um, for taking on a first year scholar. We appreciate Absolutely. it. She's wondering, she's, she's carrying a, a heavy load right now. She's been great. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, all right, well, let's talk about your research because it is terribly fascinating. So you're you're looking over this 70 year, I think you said 70 year time frame. What are what are some things that you um, discovered in your research that surprised you or, um, you know, or or will lead you to the next round of research, whatever that will be that mm -hmm. opens up another door of discovery for you? So just, just focusing on the ivories here, because my research really is a conversation between the photography and the ivories, but for today, we're just going to really focus more on the ivories. Um, I think, you know, in looking at imagery over the course of 70 some years of production, so these ivories really begin to appear uh, along the Luongo coast in the 1840s. Um, and by about 1910, they really they, they don't disappear, but really they shift into different forms. And so 19, uh, sorry, 1840 to 1910 is really the period that I'm looking at. And I think um, in a way, not surprisingly, but one of the most prolific and recurring images that I'm seeing um, throughout all of the ivories are, are really images of commodified human beings. Uh, and of images of violence. And, um, you know, so what this says to us is that one, these are really important historical documents and that this is imagery that is coming out of the legacy of the transatlantic slave trade that officially ends on the books in, in 1808, but we know in reality continues. In fact, the last um, documented slip ship to leave the Luongo coast, which was a major provider of people to the Americas was the Huntress, which left in 1865, a bound for Louisiana with 200 people on board. Um, so this, this raises tantalizing questions as to, to the degree to which these images on these tusks are in fact uh, documenting from an African perspective, uh, the transatlantic slave trade. And so that opens up a really, I think, fascinating, just thinking ahead to um, other bigger projects um, that this is a visual record that uh, could be brought into dialogue with mostly text-based um, databases, like the Slave Voyages database, which really brings together three different collections that are predominantly uh, text-based and European-produced um, records. So, um, so right there is, uh, I think, a really rich opportunity for for an even ex a very different and expanded project that could come out of this. And how do you find the ivory, Jessica? Is it is there just a network that you have already established because of the world that you're working in? Or, and second to that question is, where have you found ivory that you weren't expecting to find it? Have there been any surprises in your your journeys? Mm -hmm. So um, this is a vast amount of material. It is phenomenal how productive the artists were. And we don't even know how, it looks as though they were not that many artists producing these works, but there are hundreds and hundreds of ivories and they're everywhere. Um, so uh, in terms of surprises, um, one of the things that I'm discovering is that I probably need to go to India. <laughs> Um, it turns out that quite a few of these ivories were purchased in India and then brought back to the United States or brought back to Europe and entered museum collections there. So that's one of the things I'm finding is a number of ivories are coming in with an attribution that they were collected in Asia, which means that they were misattributed. They were attributed to, to Indian artists when, when in fact I know they're African artists. So that's a whole other fascinating aspect of this. This says that not only were these ivies being produced in Africa and heading straight to Europe or America, but they were also going around the African continent uh, into the Asian market in, in the 1900s. How do I find them? Um, exhibition catalogs, 
uh, a lot of it is looking at museum websites. So increasingly museums are putting, you know, some of their collections online. Sometimes it's an obscure footnote in a book or an unpublished dissertation. Certainly a lot of it is networking, uh, speaking with scholars who work in this field, writing to museums. Uh, and to date, I've really focused mostly on museum collections. I actually haven't delved into the private collection aspect of this. In part, that's because um, the first collections I'm documenting are sort of in bulk. So for instance, um, last summer, I went to Cincinnati Museum of Art and they have 27 tusks. So that's a giant payload of work to, to work with there. And not only that, but I'm also looking at collections where there are photographs and ivories that, that were produced at the same time in dialogue with one another. Um, and so far, I'm finding that in museum collections as opposed to private ones. The, there's a question that came in from uh, Brandon Lundy. He says, crates of ivories have been recovered from the Atlantic floor in explorations of shipwrecks off the West African coast. What happens to these raw materials once they are salvaged? Should they be destroyed, held in museums? Just curious about your thoughts regarding uncarved ivory as well. Good questions, okay. Brandon. Great question. Thanks, Brand Brandon. It's good. great to have you here. Um, yeah, so that's a, a really thorny question that gets gets to the sort of the ethics issue. Um, I would say no, absolutely they need to be they need to be uh, preserved. Um, they're important historical documents. Um, first of all, ivory is it's it's part of an animal, and so the first thing that can happen, and this applies not only to that specific example, but there's a lot of raw ivory in natural history museums around the world, and uh, the elephant species is in a dire situation. So in the early 1800s, they were estimated to be t over 26 million uh, elephants on the African continent. And that's, there are two species of, of African elephant, they're forest elephants, and then the savanna elephant, which is the one that tended to get uh, hunted for its ivory because it has bigger tusks. Um, today, we're looking at a situation where the elephant uh, population has dwindled to under uh, 500,000 elephants. And at the rate of uh, at least 100 deaths per day, the species is on track to be extinct by, by 2040. So this is a very dire situation. And uh, I can certainly speak about sort of the legal things and the conservation efforts that are in play now. But when it comes to the issue of historical ivory, the, the uncarved ivory, whether it's found in a ship or whether it's in, you know, whether it was hunted by Teddy Roosevelt, uh, our president, who was a big game hunter and is now in a natural history museum, it's still a very important source of information. So the DNA, we can do DNA tests on it, which can help us reconstruct um, the, the history of the species of, uh, um, as an animal. Uh, elephants have been dramatically um, their habitats have been dramatically curtailed. And so our understanding of the history of the species and its distribution on the continent is really dependent on the ivory tusks that have survived, the raw ivory tusks. I might add though, one could equally test carved ivory um, to gain information. And that would be a very interesting project is to, to test the ivories that have been carved from Loango, and then would it would give us information about where exactly that ivory came from, how far it had traveled before it reached the coast uh, and was turned into art objects. Similarly, I would argue, um, and you know, historic ivory, you know, ivory has been an art medium going back, uh, you know, it was in a very important and highly sought after art medium in ancient Egypt throughout the Mediterranean world in antiquities. Um, and uh, when it comes to the Loango coast, I, I believe that these tasks are very important historical documents documenting the 19th century from a local African perspective. And so to destroy them would be to destroy an important historical record. Jessica, are there plans, and maybe you said this in the video, I can't remember, to, to bring some of the that artwork back to the local communities? Do they have their do they have museums where they're displayed or are they just still dispersed all over the world? So certainly issues of repatriation when it comes to African art are are, are at the forefront right now uh, for museums worldwide. 
Um, and there have been, there are incredible efforts in play, for instance, uh, when it comes to work that was forcibly removed from Africa. Now, the Luongo tusks are a slightly different situation. Uh, one of the reasons I was drawn to studying them is because these are artworks that were by and large commissioned by Europeans, carved by Africans. So they fit into their, their commodities. They were works that were produced for sale and intended to leave the African continent. So when it comes to repatriation claims, they don't really fit into the classic rationale for repatriation. Um, that said, they are clearly very historic, important historical documents. Um, and I think what my goal is, and this is this is third phase of the project, is in bringing together and creating a digital archive of work that is scattered worldwide you can essentially repatriate the material through a digital platform, uh, whether it be to Africa or any really anywhere in the world. And it, it really opens up accessibility to, to all and especially to um, communities in Africa. Good, thank you. Uh, there's The questions are rolling in, so I'm going to keep going. Um, a, another good question here is talking about um, the difference between East Africa um in west africa so it says uh, ivory coast is named after ivory are you planning on expanding your study beyond the congo right great question um no <laughs> uh this this project in and of itself is is huge and uh it just it keeps growing i mean this is i think a project that is something i could probably work on for the for the rest of my life and there's there's space and room for many many others to participate and part of my goal uh in coming on today is is to see if there are people who have ideas and who would like to participate in this um so there is a, a pretty established scholarship uh on ivory carvings elsewhere in africa especially carvings known as the sappy portuguese ivories that are some of the earliest carvings that were produced in what is today the sierra leone uh, region um the luongo coast ivories i think of all carved African ivories are the most understudied ones. So that's one of the reasons why I sort of jumped into this topic area. And it's because they were perceived to be commodities, to be sort of early forms of tourist art and therefore not necessarily um, of, of great value, but it turns out that they are. So no, I don't have plans, but certainly uh, willing to collaborate with others on projects that might bring together ivory topics from elsewhere in the continent. Thank you. Uh, next question is around what software you, you use for the 3D modeling. Right. So the, the 3D model, that's so I'm in phase one of this project. There really are three phases to this project. Phase one is gathering the material, taking the photographs, beginning to catalog it, uh, and uh, beginning an analysis of the of the images and to get a sense of trends and changes over time. Um, so we've done a little bit of experimenting with 3, 3D, model, 3D modeling and 3D printing, but I don't have protocols in place. Um, so that's going to be the next project. But in terms of 3D mod uh, modeling there, uh, ZBrush is a great program and then also using photogrammetry. Um, and then th in terms of 3D printing, uh, we have incredible resources here at KSU, right here in the School of Art and Design, we have 3D printers. Um, I haven't used the 3D printers here, um, but certainly um, we'll be heading in that direction fairly soon. You see, people are so excited about this research. They want you to go to phase <laughs> two and three as soon as possible. <laughs> All right, the next question is um, uh, talking about repatriation. Maybe you've already answered this before, but the question is specifically about ivory and are there museums that are considering repatriating these objects to the country where they belong? And what are the concerns in museums around space issues? And I'd like for you, I'd like to expand that question for you to talk a little bit about the material itself, because you and I talked earlier this week about what people are, because it's Ill illegal, what people are doing with the product itself. And I think that's really an important thing to, to mention. Sure, we can talk about the medium and then we can talk about sort of the repatriation issue. So, um, 
So Ivory is, I, I'm sure everyone's aware that, that Ivory currently, uh, it's illegal to purchase um, Ivory. Um, uh, you can purchase, uh, and so these works would fall into that category, um, uh, Ivory artworks that are considered to be over 100 years old, that, that they, they fall into a sort of an antiquities category. Um, or if they were imported into the United States before 1982, if they came in after 1982 and they are antiquities, so they're older than 100 years, they still have to enter, of course, with a lot of paperwork, which typically artworks don't have, but they have to enter through one of 13 American ports that are, con that are designated as antiquities ports. Atlanta is not one of them. So if you're abroad, and you purchase an ivory that's considered an antiquity and you fly into Atlanta with it, it's considered to be illegal. Um, in, 20, in 2016, I uh, curated an exhibition at the Zuckerman Museum of Art that included ivories as well as photography. And what happened is, um, in fact, this had started a number of years prior, and from 2013 onwards, a number of states, especially New York City, actually began ivory crushes. So what they were doing is, Ivories that were brought into the country or had been sold illegally that didn't fit those criteria that I just explained were being gathered up and were being publicly crushed. Um, there have been burnings of ivory in 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 Africa, and um, it's become so difficult even for museums to move ivories even within the United States between states because the paperwork that's the the Fish and Wildlife. Um, people, wildlife service require, it's extremely difficult to show that. So, you know, if an ivory from Luongo entered 100 years ago, it probably doesn't have paperwork to document that. Um, so this means that the digital archive and the digital platform, as well as the 3D printing, becomes even more important because increasingly we're seeing a situation where these works have to stay within their host museums. Many museums are even reticent to put them on display. And so increasingly we're engaging with them through replicas and through digital imagery. Um, to the best of my knowledge, I'm not aware of any repatriation efforts of Luanga Coast Ivories to Africa. That said, there are many cases of objects, African objects made out of ivory that are part of repatriation cases. Perhaps the most well known would be uh, the very famous um, mosques, small hip mosques from Benin in Nigeria that represented a queen mother, Queen Idea. Uh, there's one in the British Museum, there's one in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and these works were looted from the uh, King's Palace in Benin in the late 1800s. Um, and there have been decades worth of, of cases um, and attempts to, to repatriate those works. I might add that, again, you know, these works are all over the world. It's, it's extremely expensive and it's very difficult to bring them, to bring a collection of materials scattered all over the world in private collections, uh, in museums, in different countries with different laws. Uh, the, the, the legal expenses alone are just exorbitant. And so increasingly what we're seeing is a situation where digital, the digital platform is being used as a way to reassemble collections and open access to open museum storerooms um, as a first step at least. Good, thank you. Um, a question from our uh, math and science colleagues. Have you collaborated with individuals outside your area, such as biologists, for the DNA analysis and provenance of the TUS? And, I, and I'm going to expand that to say, have you collaborated with colleagues outside of your field in general? It doesn't have to be biologists, but, but, but other fields. Right. So I have not collaborated with a biologist, although I did meet a biologist at a conference in Portugal last uh, February who does work on DNA tusks. Uh, in fact, she's working on a project, uh, tusks that were found on a shipwreck off the Angolan coast. So the ship had just left Luango and got shipwrecked. It was bound for India. And so she's working on that material and she's an expressed an interest uh, in a collaborative project. So where I am um, collaborating beyond sort of 
art, the art historical field would be uh, the ivory tusks. I don't know if anyone noticed, many of them have black lines on them. Those are incised lines that are filled with a black pigment. So strictly speaking, these are ivories slash pigment. Um, and uh, so I've been interested in what that pigment is. And so I'm working on a project with a number of conservators in different museums to take samples of the pigment and to test it um, and to, to see what if there's a consistency, if there are differences, again, the pigment could help us get a better uh, understanding of individual artists' hands, of regions, of locations. Um, so that's one project that still keeps me within the museum field, but working with conservators. Good, thank you. Uh, this is a question from your dean, and he said, he asks, uh, as you research the work of ivory artists from different regions in South Africa, do you find different carving techniques relative to the artists from different areas or emerging from different time periods? Um, thank you, Ivan, for your question. So, so just to clarify that my research is along the Luongo coast, which is from Gabon to Angola, um, and it's 1840 to 1910. And so what I'm looking, one of the, one of the questions I'm trying to, in fact, how I started this project was trying to track works and assemble works by one particular artist. And it, this just so happened because I, there was an ivory in the museum where I worked and I needed to research that object. Um, and so one of the things I'm trying to figure out is how many artists were there? Where did they work? Who were they? What class did they belong to? And um, there are quite a few ivories in collections that I'm working on that are unfinished. And this is a great resource because it opens up a window to uh, understanding how they were carved. And um, I believe that most of the artists were working in workshops. So these were not works where one single artist was necessarily carving the entire tusk. Uh, when I look at uh, the analysis I've done of a collection in Buffalo and the Cincinnati collection in particular, where there are uh, over 10 tusks that are in various stages of production, it appears that the artist blocked out the figures, did the sort of the basic sculptural work first, and then came back and did all the detailed work. In Buffalo, we know there were actually two artists. One probably did the sculptural blocking out of the composition and the form, and the other guy did the detail. So we probably have a situation where, you know, some artists were really good at doing fine detailed work and others were better at doing the sculptural work. So these works might actually be, we should really think of them more as collaborative than the work of a single artist. Great. Um, I have a question related to the field work that you talked about in the video, and you talked about the different languages that you did not speak that you had to navigate. So I wonder if you could give us a little insight in how you were able to navigate doing research in that community with all of those barriers that you discussed. Right. So it would seem that my, my PhD research is very different to the project that I'm working on now. And, and certainly it is in terms of the methodologies that I'm using. However, in both cases, I was dealing with issues around commodification and work that's often perceived to be tourist art and therefore is devalued. And I wanted to kind of change that conversation. So, uh, and the other reason is as a PhD student in the United States, I desperately wanted to go back home. So I got to work in South Africa and Botswana where I grew up uh, with rural communities. Um, but uh, so the languages spoken, um, Khoisan languages, the, I couldn't learn them before I left. They're, these are languages that have not, there are no dictionaries. You, you show up and you start learning. Um, and, you know, I was, there, were, there are four different languages uh, spoken by the different communities. They're extremely difficult languages to learn. Uh, there are click sounds, which uh, f stand in for consonants. There are five different click sounds. Um, uh, your tongue gets the most incredible workout. I, I realized English is a very lazy language. We do not use our tongue in the, in the full range of what the mouth can do. Um, so I relied heavily on translators. Um, and typically I worked, uh, you know, with multiple tr uh, translators to kind of check things. Um, 
uh, Afrikaans, which was not my home language. It was a language I learned in school uh, and it was a language that I very much associated with apartheid and sort of had had some 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 issues with ironically turned out to be the lingua franca that that we used um, extensively. It was uh, an incredible experience. Um, I realized that the methodologies that I had prepared to do uh, as a PhD student, I had to completely rethink when I got into the field, including, for instance, the IRB. When I showed up with my IRB and my set of interview questions, uh, it became clear very quickly that people weren't going to sign off on it. And in fact, I was told that there needed to be community wide input into my project. And it took many, many months before I heard back that I was being given permission to do the project. But at, even then, the IRB was not signed. Uh, people were not comfortable signing a document. Um, and so in, in, in the end, I got an oral confirmation. Um, so I was set to interview artists. Again, that didn't work. That didn't make any sense locally because it turned out that the artists, again, worked in a collective. A lot of what they did was shared. And uh, it was extremely uncomfortable for artists to be interview interviewed individually. And so I abandoned formal interviews. Um, it also became apparent that I was going to, that I, my identity was going to be, I had to completely rethink my identity. At the time I was 30 years old, I was not married, I did not have children. And essentially socially, I was the equivalent of a teenager. And I was told very quickly that I should go and hang out with the teenagers, uh, which turned out to be uh, a wonderful opportunity because I learned the language. Um, young teenage uh, women were extraordinarily generous. They took me under their wing. They loved to gossip. So I learned a lot about the community that way. It sort of became a backdoor into the community. But I think the most important thing I learned is that my research um, did not give me validity in the community. I needed to find a role beyond asking questions. And uh, so I, I realized there was a need amongst teenage women um, to have access to, uh, to jobs. They really were very hemmed in. They were living in a rural area. And so I started a beat and, and they had incredible skills, especially in making clothes and producing beautiful beadwork. And so I started a beadwork project um, in which I provided the raw materials that they didn't have access to. They made the beadwork and then I, I took them to Johannesburg and Pretoria and sold them and they got paid paid back. Uh, they were, you know, I, I had to give, I had to sort of, I had to become a fully functioning member of the society, of, of the community. And so my name was, I was the bead lady. I wasn't the researcher, I was the bead lady. So I, I love that story. Um, it shows the best intentions of research. Just because you have an IRB approved protocol doesn't mean that that's what's going to happen when exactly. you're actually collecting data. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, who who is interested in this research? How you know you've been trapped? You do a lot of traveling um, to collect this information to put it together in a in a form that the external stakeholders can view. Where does your funding come from to do this work? So this project started, it was funded through uh, the Mellon Foundation, um, and it actually started the last year I was at the Michael C. Carlos Museum. And uh, so it started as part of a collection sharing project, which was to help curators get into museum collections that had been uh, ignored, that were very under um, researched. And so this was one of those places. Um, since then, uh, I've got a lot of funding through the College of the Arts, which has been wonderful. The last two years I've been in an administrative role, and so this work has been a little bit on hiatus. Um, but uh, the project is definitely growing now that I have a substantial body of, of, of material, um, but I've barely scratched the surface. I mean, I have documented 50 tusks, and there are hundreds um, more to be looked at. Um, in terms of you know, for whom this is intended. So the first thing I do is um, I share my records with the museums uh, that give me access to their collections. I take hundreds of photographs. I take up a lot of their time. And so this becomes a resource for them. They can add to their database. Some of them have already put 
the material online. Um, uh, one of the other things I think the other benefits of this project is because I'm going in and looking at collections that really have not had a lot of attention. Some, sometimes I find things in storerooms that museums didn't know they had or that were misattributed. Uh, when I was in Buffalo last summer, uh, thanks to a very obscure footnote in a PhD dissertation, I discovered an, an, unknown, an unpublished uh, volume, a photo album of photographs um, that was taken in Buffalo in 1901 during the Pan American Exposition. And there were two artists, Luongo artists, that had been brought to carve tusks as part of the, the exposition. And this undocumented um, album of photographs includes photographs of the artists of the village where they, they worked. And so that, that was a, a really amazing find. Uh, for the museum, who's now going to collaborate with the History Society in Buffalo and actually publish that as a as a sort of a sideline project. Uh, so, you know, I think the benefit is an overlooked genre of work that clearly has extraordinary potential uh, in, for spin-off uh, research projects by myself and by others. Uh, it's it's multidisciplinary in its potential. Do you foresee? Um publishing a book of yes. all of these Yes, I have a book project uh, in the works, which uh, it brings together the photography and, and the public the published photographs. Well, we've had lots of questions come through the chat. Uh, does anyone want to ask a question in person? Raise your, raise your hand if you want to. Um, I'll ask another one. We're almost out of time, but I'm going to ask a few more. So it, um, if one were to have a an heirloom piece of ivory in their jewelry box, what does one do with that? Mm -hmm. What is the right thing to do? Right. Well, um, if you if you're I would say keep it. Um, don't don't feel don't burden yourself with guilt over it, but you're probably not going to be able to sell it uh, because of the stringent laws around uh, governing the sale of, of ivory. Uh, antiquities dealers, art dealers are extremely reticent to uh, provide appraisals for ivory. Um, it's very difficult to uh, move it across state lines or certainly you know, internationally. So if you inherited um, ivory, even if it's historic ivory from a relative in France to uh, get the legal paperwork needed to prove that it is over 100 years old, that it, it entered France before 1982. Uh, it's so extraordinarily difficult to achieve that. So I discourage everyone from purchasing ivory, especially ivory carved during the 20th century. As a museum curator, I receive phone calls at least five or six times a year um, from people in Georgia who had just inherited a collection that you know their missionary uncle um, had put together uh, of ivory that they acquired uh, from the Congo, and they wanted to know what to do with it. Would could they gift it to the museum? Could they sell it? And and really, I was stumped as to what to do with it because we could not we we could not ac accept it into our collections. Um, and, and similarly, uh, I, you know, I could not advise her or even steer her to an auction house or a dealer who would be willing to, to purchase the material. So my answer would be keep the material if it has sentimental value to you, um, appreciate it for that reason. Good, thank you. Um, well, any other questions? We're just about out of time. Uh, Jessica, I want to give you the the last. Whoop! There's an, another message came in. Just one second. Uh, are you only focused on elephant ivory? Have you come across any carvings made of things like hippopotamus ivory? Do the same rules apply? Yeah, that's a great question. So yes, there are tusks uh, that have definitely been carved out of other ivory, including hippopotamus ivory. Um, Hippopotamus, uh, they, the hippopotamus ivory does not, but then again, to verify that you really would have to do a, t a, a test, a DNA test, but I can tell if it's not hippo ivory based on the form. Uh, hippo ivory, it's always much smaller. 
It has a very different grain to it. Uh, typically, it doesn't have a really smooth, perfect cylindrical shape. Um, so I'm finding uh, carved tusks uh, in quite a few collections. Uh, there's one in Buffalo. And the interesting thing about those ivories is some of them come in with notes suggesting that these were tusks that were carved for local clientele. They were carved for elite Africans, that they were not actually meant for a Western market. So that's, that says that there's, a, there's another layer to this conversation is that we shouldn't assume that all of the tusks were carved exclusively for an international clientele, that the genre was being produced for a local clientele, but interestingly, not necessarily in ivory, but in hippo. Um, so clearly, you know, the, uh, the hippo is another animal that um, is endangered, less so for poaching, more because of uh, encroachment on its environment. Great, thank you. Um, I think there might be a great story about your field work, work experience. Our PhD students need to hear it from you someday. Have you returned to the village after your dissertation? That's a great question. Thank you for that. Yes, I have. So uh, um, I returned in two, in, when I finished my PhD, I, I returned and gave a copy of my PhD to, um, I, I couldn't give a, a copy to every artist, but um, the, the senior member of each group received a copy. A copy was also given to uh, the NGOs and the, um, the governing bodies of the community, and then a copy also went into an archive in Cape Town. So I did return it, and I also organized an exhibition that was one of the other uh, investments I made um, in, in exchange. You know, I got a PhD out of this, um, so I, I also organized uh, an exhibition uh, in Atlanta uh, in 2013 um, featuring work by, by artists from these collectives. So I've, I've actually been back twice. I, I love to hear that. I mean, how, how many people have PhDs that are bound into a book but sit on a shelf and collect dust and never never change the world around them and it sounds like you've really um given back so i i appreciate that so much and thank you so much for your time jessica this has been really wonderful um i'm going to um i'm going to do some shameless marketing uh from the office of research because i have this forum and i'm just gonna do it um but we have the symposium of student scholars event uh that ksu holds for our students and that date is december 3rd so i would just strongly encourage all the um, faculty and staff that are participating today to to um, to listen to how wonderful our students are. And if you would like to be a judge for many of the many proposals that we've received for that um, for that symposium, uh, please go to our website and sign up to be a, a judge. There there are lots of proposals that will come in, and we need some help with that. And then just also to remind you, we do have one more research with relevance show on December 4th. It's our last one for this semester, and we will be featuring Mario Brettfield, Brettfeld, who is a plant ecophysiologist from the College of Science and Math. And he's going to be discussing his work that has enabled him to explore vastly different ecosystems around the globe. And so with that, uh, thank you again, Jessica, and to everyone who um, has participated, thank you so much. And from the Office of Research, we wish you happiness and healthy, be very healthy in this coming up into the Thanksgiving season, and we will see you in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is wonderful. Thank you.